All right, so let me ask you a question, because this is one of those sermons that people think, oh, I know who needs that sermon. All right, so how many of you know a person that you would say they're ungrateful? They're just not a grateful person, right? Don't get in trouble with your wife by looking at her while you do that. Okay, now, then I would ask you this question. Now, please don't raise your hand, but how many of you are ungrateful, right? Nobody thinks they're ungrateful. Everybody thinks, I'm a grateful person. So here's the question. When's the last time you told somebody you appreciated them? When's the last time that you went out of your way, not just to say thank you, but to say, you know what? I appreciate you and you fill in the blank. If you haven't done that lately, and if you can think of three or four times you criticized or critiqued or had your X list out, and you went to somebody and said, you need to fix this and this is wrong, then you're probably the one who needs this sermon today. But I'm sure it's nobody in this room. Because we love all of you and we know you're all got it together. Listen, I need this sermon. There are days where I am not grateful. And here's the thing. How many of you would like to feel happier? Right? That's easy, right? Everybody wants that. That's what people want. They think YouTube's going to bring it. Uh, You'd like to be less afraid, improve the quality of your life. And here's the thing. Gratitude improves family relationships. Hey, kids who are in this room, you want to improve relationship with your mama? They're sleeping right through this part. Thank her. And and be grateful. Not a fake thank you. Not a thank you, mother. Right? But a real gratitude. Thank you for what you've done or for what you're doing. Now, do you know what this is? This is fake firewood. And it is not nearly as good as real firewood. But here's the advantage to this. You throw this in the fireplace, and you get a match, and you go, and the next thing you know, you got a fire for about two hours. It does not smell the same. If you cook a marshmallow on it, you will die. It does not last as long. It doesn't put out as much heat, right? So it's not as good. Now, here's the thing. I, for those of you who don't know, I live in the woods, and I have cut down quite a few trees, including oak trees, and so I have oak wood. The problem is, in order to put that oak in the fire, I gotta go out, I gotta cut it up, I gotta dry it out, I gotta get it ready, I gotta put it on the fireplace, and it doesn't start as easily as this does, so I gotta do a little bit of work to get it going. So, most of the time, you know what I do? I'm lazy. Let me tell you something. All of us have an entire forest of things to be grateful for. But the truth is, most of the time, we just don't go out and take the time. To be grateful. We don't take the time to be grateful for people until they die. Which is crazy, by the way. Because they're not there for that part. Say things to people that you would want to say at their funeral before their funeral. That would be a great start for gratitude. Because here's the thing. Let's be honest. And when you look at these verses. I'm going to look at some verses today that aren't in the book by John Ortberg. But they really relate to this story. Gratitude, honestly, is not a natural fleshly emotion. We tend to be judgmental. We tend to be busy and in a hurry all the time. I mean, how many times have you gone into Publix and you compare the lines? And then whoever leaves before you, you're upset. Oh, man, I got in the slower, right? Right? And and the guy last night who didn't turn left when the light turned green, I reminded him by utilizing this device on my car that let him know. Get out of the way. We have places to go. And I'll get there three seconds faster if you will move, right? So busyness messes up. But then otherwise, sometimes we're just blind to what's really going on around us. We don't even walk into the forest to see the blessings that we have. And So today I'm going to talk about how we can be more grateful by giving grace to others. Sometimes just taking a break and being grateful. And then also just looking. Just paying attention to the blessings. So here's the first one. We miss the joy because of judgment. Now, I had an English teacher. You probably had a teacher like this. Because last night when I told this story, I could hear audible. I had an English teacher when I was a senior in high school. Required a 15-page double-spaced paper. I turned in a 15-page double-spaced paper. I was going to pass this class because I wanted to graduate. He took off a point for every page that there was not a... A number in the corner. I had put the number in the wrong place for every page. So he took off 15 points to start. At my school, that was a C already. And by the time I was done, I got an F on a 15-page paper where I followed what I thought were all the directions except a couple of commas here and there that he didn't like. And I got an F. A friend of mine who literally like quadruple spaced 
and did their paper like the least amount they could, turned in seven pages, a seven-page, lousy written paper, no articles, no help, got a better grade than I did. How many of you think I wanted to do anything for that teacher again? How many of you had a teacher like that? Some of you work with people like that. That no matter what you do, they just raise the bar higher. And after a while, you just don't want to do anything for them. Well, there were people like that in Jesus' day. And they were called religious leaders. And the truth is, all of us as Christians, if you're not careful, you will move from relationship with Jesus and being so grateful that you're a Christian into a country club atmosphere where you think it's about you. And you forget what gratitude is. Listen to this story. In Luke chapter 7, verse 37, this is a story that's in all four Gospels. A woman in the town who lived a sinful life. Now, that's a great start to a story. That would probably be how they would describe Pastor Eric. The pastor who lived a sinful... uh, Hopefully not. All right. A woman in the town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at a Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. So I want you to see the scene. You did not sit at a table back then. You let, I wish we would go back to that. That just sounds like a wonderful way to eat. You just lay next to the table and just shovel it into your mouth. That just sounds awesome. But your feet are away from you. And so she came and was washing his feet. Now, there was an important reason. By the way, we don't know who this woman is. Um, some people argue that it's Mary Magdalene. Other people argue that it's somebody else. And here's the answer. We don't know, and it's okay, and it's okay not to know, but don't act like you're smarter than everybody else, and you know for sure, because unless God came in a vision and showed you who it was, when you get to heaven, they'll, I think we're going to have like a game show, like, which person was it? Da, 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 da. Person A, Mary Magdalene. Person B, some unknown person you ever heard of. Person C, you know, and you know, we'll be like, oh, I don't know, hey, right? And then, and then we'll have Jonah. It'll be like, which fish do you think ate Jonah? Whale. Uh, Giant fish, fish God created out of nowhere. Which one? A, B, C. Oh, I think it's A, you know, or whatever, right? So, and then it continues. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is. One of the biggest signs of Christian immaturity is people who talk about others and don't talk to others. Did you hear me? One of the biggest signs that you are immature, or I am immature as a Christian, is I will talk about somebody, but I won't talk to them. Jesus could see this guy's bubble words, right? You ever seen that in the cartoons? Jesus knew people's thoughts, which is... An awesome thought, and, but we're very glad that doesn't happen. Apparently, there's a new movie out where that actually happens, where the guys, they can actually, their thoughts just are yelled all the time. That's not good for any of us. Because some of you would be like, bacon, right now, just bacon, right in the middle of church. I'd look up, and I'd be like, bacon? Why are you thinking of bacon? And then it would distract me, and then I'd be thinking, man, I never did like that person. And you'd hear that, and, right? But God, but Jesus could hear everything, Right? The Pharisee, though, what was he doing? He was judging her for her sin. He thought he was better than her. But there was another person judging, and it's actually in a different passage about the same story. John chapter 12, verse 4 and 5. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. Why was Judas judging her? Because of his sin, because of his greed, because he cared more about money than he cared about people. Did you hear me? Cared more about money than he cared about people. Anytime we care more about money than we care about people, we miss God's blessing. And we do it so often. We're in a world where money is everything. We think money is all there is. By the way, you don't have to have money to love money. You can be the poorest person in the room and love money. 
Because if you love money more than people, you're going to miss God's blessing. So think about which do you think about more, helping people or your budget? Give grace to others for their differences. Understand that everybody's different than you. Some people have different personalities. Some people are different. But you know what? They all need grace. What does that mean? We're all imperfect. How many of you are imperfect? Would you raise your hand if you're imperfect? All right. And Carl, you didn't have to raise your wife's hand. All right. So the truth is, right, we all know that we're... <laughs> Debbie's like, leave me alone. All right. We all know that we're imperfect. And yet, when somebody does something, we're like, they're so dumb. Can't believe they did it. I did a wedding on the beach yesterday, dried my eyes out. Oh my goodness gracious, a cool day, windy day on the beach, but it was beautiful. The waves were just right. We were on the beach, family, and a beautiful couple. And as I did their wedding, in the middle of the wedding, I stopped and I said, listen, do you want to have a great marriage? And they both said no, and I said, okay, forget it. No. I said, do you want a great marriage? Of course, they uh huh They're going to nod at anything. They have no idea what I said yesterday. And I said, every day. Text each other what you appreciate about each other every day. Every day say what you're thankful for. Just sometime in the middle of the day when you're out doing something, think, you know what, I like when she does it, and text her. I said, it takes five seconds to text somebody. And so you don't just get in this process of becoming business partners where let's do this, let's do that, let's get here, let's get there, let's do this, let's do that. And we are so tied up in all the stuff we Forget what really matters, so we give each other grace. I love what Mark Batterson says. Nine times out of ten, criticism is a defensive mechanism. We criticize in others what we don't like in ourselves. We are the man behind the curtain in Wizard of Oz. Don't look at me, look over there, because so you won't see my flaws. Let me point out somebody else's flaws so you won't notice that I'm messed up and I'm broken. And that's why sometimes admitting, you know what? I don't have it all together. Sometimes when somebody comes to you and criticizes you or gets on to you or they say something and maybe they say it the wrong way. Instead of initially going, what are you talking about? Maybe we just take a breath and say, is any of what they're saying true? Now, sometimes all you can say is, I'm sorry you felt that way, but that's an awful thing to say to people. But the truth is, sometimes some of what they say, maybe only 1%, but some of what they say is true. And we need to recognize that in us. Number two. So not only do we miss joy because of judgment, we miss miracles for, or the miracle for the miles. What does that mean? We're in such a hurry to get places, we don't notice anything. Years ago, in October 25th of 1999, right out of Orlando here, a plane left with Payne Stewart on it. And we all know the story, Payne Stewart's plane went up and it never turned, so they sent out fighter jets to see what was going on. And they went up and the pilot looked at the, at the plane and it was iced over from the inside. They know that at some point the plane lost cabin pressure. They never did figure out exactly what happened, but they found out something interesting. That the company that owned the plane in a previous flight had sent the plane up knowing there were pressurization problems. Anybody have an idea of what happened? They were in such a hurry to get that plane out and get it up that they didn't worry about what was really going on inside of the plane. Can I tell you something about us? Sometimes we're so in a hurry to get something done. we got to make this happen. I'll give you another example. You ever go on vacation or see somebody on vacation and they get in a fight on vacation over somebody not hurrying? I said to Kristen one day, I said, we're not in a hurry. She said, what do you mean we're not in a hurry? we got to go. I said, the purpose of our trip is not to get places. The purpose of our trip is to enjoy each other's company. So if we never get to where we're going, I don't care because the purpose of the trip is to enjoy each other. Too often we're so busy trying to get somewhere, we elbow everybody out of the way on the way there, and we literally ruin the purpose of what we're doing. Now, on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border, Luke 17, between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. Now, time out. When a leper was going down the street, they would go on one side of the street, they would have to walk on the opposite side of anybody else, and they would have to yell these words, 
unclean, unclean. Now, if, you, if I ever have a cold, there's actually days that I will do this. If you've not been around me when I have a cold, I literally will tell you, unclean. And people look at me weird, and they're like, where did you learn that? And I go, seminary. Anyway, <clears throat> and then Jesus said, go show yourselves to the priest. By the way, that's what you did when you were cleansed. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, listen, one out of 10, when they saw they were healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And I love this, they add, and he was a Samaritan. Basically, the person who should have been the least grateful was the most grateful. Jesus asked, weren't all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. We make lots of mistakes, listen, when we're in a hurry. When we make getting somewhere more important than the people around us. When we make accomplishing a task more important than the people we're accomplishing it with. We ruin the moment. All the time. And when we're in a hurry, we do dumb things. This morning, I was in a hurry getting out of the house. I got in the car. I put it in reverse. I started backing out. And I realized I forgot my phone. So I had to go in the house and look for my phone. I had to actually call my phone. Have you ever had to call your phone to find your phone? That is the weirdest thing. Can you call my phone so I can find my phone? Right? When do you make mistakes? When you're in a hurry. When you're in a hurry, you, you run through stuff. Listen. Slow down enough to love the people around you and appreciate the people around you. Don't get in such a hurry. Listen, I'm a task-oriented person. I get it, okay? I got a tree to cut down at my house. All I can think about is I got to cut that tree down before it falls in my yard and hurts somebody, right? So that's all I can think of. Got to get it done, got to get it done, got to get it done. But when you get in that mode, you have to <gasps> take a break from the busy to give thanks. That's your next challenge. Take a break from the busy. I love Thanksgiving week. I love Thanksgiving week. It's my favorite week. I like it more than Christmas. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But I'm busy. Christmas time, I'm busy. We got Christmas Eve services. I'm just, you know, I got stuff to get done. Thanksgiving, nobody expects me to do anything. I love it. I love it. Nobody, everybody's like, oh, I'm going to leave you alone, pastor. I know it's Thanksgiving week. I'm like, thank you, Jesus. Anyway, but you know, right? And it's also a special time for everybody. To give thanks. For everybody to take time to give thanks. But listen. Do this every day. You want to sleep better at night? Take a few minutes to write down what you're thankful for. It works for people who aren't Christians. So as a Christian it's going to work even more. God thank you for these things. It's not how much we have. But how much we enjoy. That makes happiness. Because we all know miserable people who have everything. And we all know happy people who have nothing. It's not your stuff. Number three. We miss the blessing due to blindness. Now, I showed you a picture of my little dog. I'm not going to show it again. But it's my little dog with his feet in the bowl. Because he's worried there's not enough food. And all he's focused on is that bowl that's empty. Not the other two bowls that are full of food. That's called a scarcity mindset. And if you're not careful, you'll develop a scarcity mindset. And it will make you blind to the blessings. So somebody at work will get promoted. And instead of being happy for them. You'll be jealous of them. Because you don't think there's another promotion. Somebody at church will get more attention than you do. And you'll say. Oh well there's not enough attention for everybody. How dare I be ignored. You're doing one ministry. And you say. How dare my ministry not be the top ministry in the whole world. Everybody should notice what I'm doing. And shouldn't notice anybody else. And when somebody else gets noticed, we go, why am I not noticed? Why? Scarcity mindset. We think there's a limited amount of praise. We think there's a limited amount of money. We think there's a limited amount of stuff. So what do we do? Fill my bowl right now. Right now, fill my bowl. Anybody in here think Buster's going to go hungry? No, that dog is fat. Now, let's continue the story. Jesus answered him, Simon. By the way, Simon is the homeowner. I think I misdid that this week in, in group. Simon is actually not Simon Peter. The homeowner's name was Simon, and he's a Pharisee. And Jesus hears what Simon is thinking. And so he looks at Simon because, remember, Jesus spoke to people, not about people. So he says, Simon, I have something to tell me. Tell me, teacher, he said. And then he went into two people owed money to a certain moneylender. One of them owed 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? 
Simon replied, I suppose the one with the bigger debt forgiven. By the way, that's a very safe answer if you say, I suppose. I suppose. Jesus said, then he turned towards the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? Time out. Judgment makes you miss people. God never asks you a question he doesn't know the answer to. See, that guy did not see the woman. What did he see? He saw her sin. So Jesus basically gets Simon's attention. Simon, psh, you see her? Nope. I came into your house, you didn't give me any water for my feet. By the way, that was really bad back then because you walked on streets where donkeys walked. And even though the Romans had roads, they still were not perfectly clean. So you would walk in a house. I mean, if you've got a few dogs at your house, you've got to be careful in your yard. Imagine a place with thousands of camels and donkeys and whatever else. Lions and tigers and bears. I mean, I know, it's terrible. You didn't give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. So this Pharisee didn't even welcome Jesus into his house. One of the signs of being a Christian is hospitality. It means you welcome people, you love people, you encourage people. One of the signs of a growing church is people who reach out to people they don't know and welcome them and care about them and don't just get stuck in their own group talking to their own group of people I used to yell at my youth leaders and I would say, bananas. And they would know what that meant. Because I would say, bananas are in a bunch. And if you're in a bunch, you're not reaching out to those new kids that are coming. And of course, I would look up almost every week and at some point, five of the youth leaders were all talking to each other. And I would look up and go, bananas! And they'd all look at each other and go, oh, we're having a good conversation here. You know, and then go and talk to people. Maybe I need to do that at our church. Bananas! All right. You did not put all my oil on my head, but she put all my perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love is shown. Listen, but whoever has forgiven, forgiven little loves little. So he's, the Pharisee is thinking he doesn't need to be forgiven very much. But we all know he does too, doesn't he? See, the truth is, sometimes we don't recognize how much we've been forgiven. So we judge other people because we don't recognize that we've been given a huge gift. We think they've been given a huge gift and we've been given a little gift. Therefore, they need to get over themselves. And the truth is, we all need to get over ourselves and realize that we need to love much. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this that even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. They were so busy judging that not only did they judge the woman, now they judged Jesus. And they missed the miracle. Such a good miracle, it's in every one of the Gospels this story is told. It made such an impression on the disciples that they all said, this is the story we want to tell. And here's the question. Do we miss all the blessings around us because we're judging and critical and pointing out flaws? We've all had that teacher who points out everything. When I taught junior high years ago, we're talking almost 30 years ago now, I had a student, and before I got this one class, several teachers came to me and said, I need to warn you about this class. And I said, oh, no. And they said, and they went on and talked about the class, and then they specifically said, especially this student. Now, what typically happens, by the way, and we have something in our brains that does this, when somebody points out, watch out for that, it's just like what happens to referees and umpires and everybody else. When they point out something, guess what they notice? What they pointed out. And I remember thinking, you know what? I'm going to give that student a chance. So that student was in my class, and I will tell you, that student wasn't perfect. But I went out of my way to make sure that student had things to do. I went out of my way to when we were doing activities to make sure that he had something specific to do. Because like me, he had a lot of energy. Years later, I went into ministry. I left that church. I was gone about three or four years. I came back to that church. And you ready for this? That student became my student intern. The best intern I ever had. He reached out to students. He encouraged them. He led small groups. It was phenomenal. And today, if you go over to the Tampa area, he is pastoring a church in that area. Now, I could have written him off. And there's a lot of people you can write off. 
Or you can look at them and say, God, I want to be a blessing to that person. How can I be a blessing? So look for the blessings around you. Go out in the forest and cut down the trees and burn the wood and take time. God has given you plenty of resources to be grateful for, but take time today to do that and especially the people in your life. Maybe on your way home, if you're riding with somebody, you just say, hey, thank you for and be specific of what you're thankful for. It's not natural for us to be grateful. It's more natural for us to be judgmental. It just is. But if we'll listen to the Lord, if we'll be sensitive to His presence, what will happen? We'll be more able to give grace to others when we don't feel like it. We'll be able to take a break and give thanks. And we'll be able to take time to look for the blessings. We have tons of them all around us. My prayer for you today is that you would be a grateful person, that God would put gratitude in your heart. Let's close in prayer today. Father, I thank you for these moments. I thank you for all that you do in our church and with people. I am grateful. Lord, we have so many grateful people at our church. And Lord, I remember as we went through Pastor Appreciation Month, I just thinking that, Lord, I don't need that because these folks appreciate our pastors and our staff every month. So Lord, thank you for grateful people who love others. Lord, I pray for the times that we become ungrateful, when we become critical, when we only see the bad side of things. Father, when we only look at the sin and we lose track of people, or we focus on money and we lose track of people, Lord, forgive us. Remind us that you own the cattle on a thousand hills and you will provide. So Lord, continue to provide for our church, but Lord, I pray you'd also continue to provide for each one that's here. May we be grateful for what we have. Lord, I pray if anyone here doesn't know you, that today would be the day they surrender to you. In Jesus' name, amen.